Welcome everyone to Flutter Beyond Podcast. I am your host Max and in today's episode we will be discussing the latest updates in the world of Flutter as well as having a chat with our special guests Hubert Bialecki and Martin Roblewski from Montreal about the state of CrossMobile 2023. And now let's dive in. First up in our Flutter updates, the Flutter Roadmap 2023 has been released, outlining key areas of focus and investment for the upcoming years. The roadmap emphasizes developer experience, performance, interoperability, portability, ecosystem, security, and fundamentals as top priorities. Next, Amplify has released version 1.0 of their Flutter libraries, which introduces a complete rewrite in Dart and supports all Flutter platforms. This exciting update includes several new features and improvements in categories such as analytics, API, authentication, and storage. In other news, the GSkinner team's Wondrous app has been nominated for the prestigious Webby Award presented annually for, by the International Academic of Digital Arts and Science. The Webby Awards celebrate excellence in the internet, recognizing the best and brightest across various fields. Congratulations to the G Skinner team on this well-deserved recognition. Cool. But now let's jump into the pre-recorded interview with Hubert Bialecki and Marcin Roblewski as they discuss the state of cross-mobile development in 2023. Enjoy. Before we continue, with today's episode, I'd like to share an awesome tool that I personally use and highly recommend, ClickUp. If you're looking for the next level for your personal or team's productivity and collaboration, ClickUp 3.0 is the perfect solution. And guess what? ClickUp even has a Flutter app. With ClickUp's next generation features, you can manage tasks, track time, automate processes and collaborate effortlessly all within a single platform and on your favorite device, thanks to their Flutter app. To try ClickUp and see what a difference it can make for your team, use your, our affiliate link in the video description below. As a disclosure, we will receive a small commission from your purchase, but this comes with no extra costs for you. Also, indirectly, you support the Flutter ecosystem. Isn't it great? And now let's get back to the show. All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guests for today's podcast. Please welcome with me Hubert Bialecki and Maci Wroblewski, both highly experienced developers from Montreal, a company that is specialized in cross-platform development. Hubert has worked in numerous projects, mastering the art of front-end development and cross-platform technologies and he is co-author of the new book, State of Cross-Platform in 2023. Marchi is a skilled developer as well and has contributed to various successful projects and brings in the Flutter expertise. Thank you both for joining us today. We are excited to learn more from your experiences and insights. And to kick things off, let's start with this by discussing your background in the career. Hubert, how did you initially get into software development and what led to your specialization in cross-platform development? Hello, thanks, Max. So yeah, I started like about nine years ago with the web technologies, mostly backed with PHP, with the HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Then also I bumped into the phone gap with Cordova, so the early stage of the cross-platform. Then, of course, I moved to the more modern web framework, so Angular, JS, then Angular, then React, and the React Native. But before, I think the first, like, real, my mm, first met with the mm, cross-platform was about the, with the Ionic and the first version based on, on Angular. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and yeah, and we've developed the app for our clients. It was the extension to the web application. Yeah, and this is the, was the first, like about the six years ago, the first application what I've done in the cross-platform framework. Then I started working with React Native and since that, yeah, I've been developing apps for using React Native mostly with really different approaches at different businesses and products itself. Cool. Sounds very interesting. And how about you, Marcin? Yeah, I actually have a very different story because I started my journey with programming by creating some games, or at least I tried to create some games. I found mm -hmm. Unity at the time and Unity, when you export the projects, you are greeted with so many different platforms that you can deploy to. And yeah, so I, I thought that this is the standard 
And then whenever market verified that I can't leave or creating games, I switched to Android native development, which was nice. But the problem, it, it, it always, I, I had this back in my head that why wouldn't I write code once and then deploy to different platforms? What, what keeps me from that? And yeah, then I started researching and there was React Native and Flutter, which was interesting. Ionic wasn't so much because of the web-based back, backend, let's say. And the, the, yeah, the difference was that React Native didn't start for on my device for some reason. I'm not sure why. Mm. And then I tried Flutter and it was just working since I haven't had any further, yeah, decisions to make. I just started with, with Flutter and yeah, we are still working together, let's say. To this point. So it was at, at infancy on Flutter, even before I think the first stable version, it was already marketed very, very highly, mm -hmm. but it wasn't yet stable. But yeah, since then I am, I'm working with Flutter. Wow. Very interesting. So two very interesting backgrounds, one coming from Android and then switching to Flutter. It's pretty interesting in general because native developers tend to stick with their technology once they started. So cool to hear that. All right. So the next question for you two would be, can you share some insights, how the work and how your journey has been and sorry, and how your roles have evolved over the years? So actually I'm not that long into the company. So mm -hmm. I started as, as a mid Flutter engineer and now I am a senior one. Mm -hmm. So for the about year and a half, not much have changed on the surface at least because I've gone in the meantime into internal efforts in Monterey. So mm -hmm. stuff like recruitment, which was also something new to me, how do you recruit people to your team? Project estimations, which give you, you know, high level overview of, of the architecture and, and planning efforts. Uh, but most, most importantly, I think mentoring was the one activity that was very humbling to me mm -hmm. and taught me a lot from to, to see, you know, projects and, and efforts into in, in programming from different perspectives from my, from my mentees. So that would be my journey. Not that long in Monterey, but yeah, already. I learned a lot. Can imagine. And how about you, Hubert? So I started working about seven years ago. I think in July, it will be seven years. So yeah, at, at that point, there was our JS, the most popular one, of course, along the jQuery, but we are in Monterey, we're using Angular JS. So, and yeah, mostly the web technologies. <laughs> then I already described, we introduced the Ionic to our tech stack. So. It was really close that the Angular JS and Angular, what was also at the time popular and introducing the, to the, to the whole world. And yeah, from that point, we, we started working with more cross-platform technologies. So with the React Native first, we, I developed quite a big app with in the, the messaging app, similar to the WhatsApp, let's say mm -hmm. in React Native. And of course, you know many different projects, but we were, were using in Monterey. I was also helping with working together with other devs and from like, no, my, my position was evolving. So like Martin explained, also I was engaged in the rec recruitations, in the project estimations, in the architecture decisions and so on. And from at some point, I also became a principal engineer. So my role now is divided to not only to the dev staff, but also more manager. So yeah, that's, that's quite a big change because, you know, at this, at this moment, it's not only about coding, <laughs> but yeah. also about organizing things internally, how the, how we work as a team across different technologies, what mm -hmm. we are using. So mostly React Native and Flutter for cross-platform. As a, as a whole company, we not only doing the cross-platform development, there is also the web part, there is a backend in Ruby on Rails or Node.js and Python. So yeah, this is quite complex and we have to work with every team together and every project is a bit different because we are using different technologies. Also, we are not doing only the mobile apps, but also the web and mobile apps, sometimes touching some desktop things. So yeah. I think it was quite a long journey. So I, I, I have managed to, to do very different things, but in tech, I'm related mostly with, with React Native at this moment. Mm -hmm. And what are your most impactful and memorable projects in the time? I mean, seven years is quite a long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, I was in the, in the one project for about, I think four years, 
in the meantime, of course, like I said, I was uh, in a few others or like, but mostly for like for a few weeks, just to help the team, other than other team. And yeah, and this one definitely would be the most impactful on my, on my career and, and my knowledge, what I gathered here, because we did like almost everything what we, you can do in the cross-platform app. So from the, from the native modules, from the separate app for the sharing app written in Swift, many challenges across the Android, iOS performance issues or any other deep links issues. So I, I, I almost popped into an, any problem, what it's possible in the cross platform. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, most of them are fixable, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think, you know, every project is really challenging at some point. It always depends how long you are working with specific project and in specific product, because it's mostly like, you know, in, 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 in web technologies. Is a bit more straightforward at this moment. We have almost one or two engines backed the, you know, the, the browsers and differences between the modern browsers are not really great. So it's, it's, it's really maybe not easy, but it's more straightforward to develop the web app to different browsers. But in mobile, we have, first of all, big differences across the Android and iOS. And then also on Android, there is a big differences between the different version of the Android itself. And also we have a lot of variation around the Android. So for different producers and so on. And yeah, Great there are we there... Have billions and billions of devices, right? That we can test yeah. against. I think Huawei is always the finest that everyone loves. How about you, Margin? What is your favorite or memorable, impactful project that you have worked on? Yeah, for me, I think it would be the one that I'm currently in. So I can't tell you much because of the NDAs, but I can tell you that it's a startup and it's growing fast. Mm -hmm. It's really humbling to, to see the, the growth, how the growth is even managed. And this introduces not only challenges on the management, management level, but also on the code base or man managing the code base level and the quality in it, because many developers are joining, many are leaving, mm -hmm. even internally switching projects. So it was, yeah, that's the most, I think memorable and impactful. I haven't had experience with this, this, that big of a team before. And yeah, this allows me to, to see how Dart is matured. So mm -hmm. the, everything that automatically manages code styling, and even you can, you know, count complexity of your code. So on the general level to see how the project is, is going and also even test frameworks are, yeah, are something to, that I am getting to know right now because we have to have a lot of tests to make sure that with all of this chaos that is ongoing with the our development, the stuff that we already have built is still working fine. So that would be cool. guess, the biggest project. Sounds like a very holistic idea of a project. That's cool. Can imagine that makes a lot of fun. Cool. All right. Then I would recommend that we jump a little bit more into the company Monterail. So as far as I know, it has grown significantly since 2010. So what do you think sets the company apart from other software engineering agencies, Hubert? I think the, the biggest difference, what I experienced is that we are doing really complex products. So we, it's not only about the development. We are starting project on the very early stage, not always, of course, but often. So starting from the workshops with the client, gathering the requirements, ideas, then through the designs. Implementation, testing, maintenance, and now growing the product for, uh, for the ongoing years. So yeah, gathering the feedback from the users and so on. So I think what is nice in our work, so we can, we can really work close to the product itself. We also have you know, impact on the, how, how the product look like. Mm. And yeah, and we can share our expertise with new clients and you know have the really broad idea what can be done from the technical, architectural and business perspective. Mm -hmm. So a lot of experience invited so that the whole customer journey can be resolved more or less. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about the approach, how you make successful projects with cross-platform development and how you ensure the quality and performance of the apps at the end? Yeah. So I can speak about Flutter part because this is what I'm specializing for and, and yeah, this is what mm -hmm. I developed. 
So we have an open source template that you can look into. It's called Monterey Flutter. And it has some opinionated set of tools that we decided is the best for us. But yeah, it was not only a nice team exercise to align on those issues, because this is always a debatable topic, whichever set of tools you should use. Every developer has, you know, the set that is more, most familiar with and likes the most. So it was quite a challenge to, to get those, those tools to, to align, but at last we did. And now we know because this is quite old. It's already a year old, I think, actively maintaining this, but still we are not doing many changes. It's just updating the, the packages that we have there. Uh -huh. And it's now tested enough that we can safely state that it's, it, it's scaling well. So uh -huh. it's scaled with the project and many projects were started in the company from this uh, template, but also on our ones for developers were started from there. And from those experiences, we had some alignments to the template itself. And now uh -huh. that's how we are making sure that the template is, is nice and it, it will fit uh, the client best. And also what we might be doing differently that other companies are doing. We are already in including even in the template and the integration framework just to yeah, not forget about this and to keep in mind that we should always have tested those at least more crucial, the most crucial paths or workflows in the application. So that's how we are trying to maintain the quality and performance. That's pretty cool. So if you have a, a template, I will also add that into the podcast notes. So if someone is interested can download it directly there. Cool. So how do you balance the needs of its clients with staying up to date to the latest technologies? Because I can imagine, especially the upgrade process is sometimes a problem, right? And if you have cool trends like AR, VR, and things like that, how do you manage to, to keep up to date with all of these and also make sure that the clients are happy at the end? Yeah. So recently we are seeing the big trend in the AI specifically. So this is definitely what may change the internet and change our work forever. <laughs> and yeah, we as a, as a Monterey also trying to reduce that topic. And also we are introducing now some AI features in our cross-platform apps because it's, yeah, it's, it could be really useful for many products, for example, for the customer support, for some like moderation in the app and things like that. So I think, you know, in general, I would say that the technology wouldn't change much here. So the cross-platform is like, you know, uh, the, 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 the biggest thing is behind the cross-platform that you can save a lot of time and, you know, and at this moment, what we are seeing on the market is that clients need some product really quickly on the, on the market the, 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 the times cha have changed a bit since like 10, 10 years ago, when we have the big startups with almost the infinite money <laughs> and you can just develop them it for years. And yeah, and that changed. We are seeing more that people want to validate the idea, idea mm -hmm. and develop something, see how it works, how the clients will use the product. So in this context, I think the cross-platform is great. And that's already some like, you know, targeting the, the client needs in, in that way. But from, you know, other perspective, I think, you know, we have to just remember when we are picking the specific technology, let's say React Native over Flutter or Flutter over Ionic or whatever, there are always some specifics regarding every cross-platform tech. Let's say Flutter won't be the best choice for some heavy content web apps when you, where you have to have CEO optimization with the server-side rendering or something like that. So uh -huh. you, you, you shouldn't like really go in that way. But on the other hand, if you just need some really simple web app with, for the as an extension to the mobile app, Flutter is great. And also what's great about the Flutter, you have already implemented the material design here, so we can really quick, quickly prototype the, the app. So yeah, every, every tech has some really pros and cons. Mostly I think, no, the benefits from that is is significant, but you have to just keep in mind that every, every tech can be used in a bit different specific projects. It makes sense. Yeah. Can absolutely understand that. Okay. But now from that discussion, I would like to switch a little bit over to the book discussion, because as far as we know, 
You have released since a couple of months the state of cross-platform in 2023, which is a development guide, right? And what did inspire you to write this book in the first place? I think the, the main reason is that I think it's a really, really big growth in the popularity of the Flutter at this moment. Mm -hmm. And I think the Flutter changed the, the market a bit because at some point I felt that it's a bit like forget, forgotten and people felt like cross-platform is not the way we should follow. <laughs> and I think Flutter, when, when it's like for about two years ago, when the popularity was started growing fast, I think it proved that the cross-platform approach is great and you can develop really, really nice apps fast with like 60 FPS out of the box. And yeah, this is what Flutter delivers. And of course, when someone like some big player like Google is on the market with that, with such tool like that, of course, the React Native also is trying to follow the standards. And this is like a good co competition between both. And yeah, I, I just wanted to share my experience and I believe like over 90% of the apps on the stores can be written the cross-platform tag because in most apps, we don't need really the native parts. And even if we need, we still can do that. We have to remember that we, we, we don't have to limit to the cross-platform at any point. So in React Native, we can easily write some parts in the, in the native part and just connect it together. Just to keep in mind that we have to communicate it somehow, but still it is doable and yeah, and many, many big players on the market doing it. And yeah, I just wanted to share my experience. And also, as I mm, said before, at this moment, we have, we, we are seeing that there is different from the client side. So they need to prototype the products faster and what it comes with a little bit cheaper. So yeah, this is the great approach what we, what we can pick. And that's the main reason I share my experiences about that. Yeah, it makes sense. I can imagine even the things that you save and project management overhead by using cross-platform is always incredible and people don't really understand that. But in the book, you discuss trends, comparisons between Flutter, React Native and Ionic, right? Can you share some key findings and highlight them from your analysis? Yeah, so first of all, if we, if we are just talking about the mobile specific things, I think the differences between the Flutter and React Native are not great. Of course, it's, I think the Flutter might be a bit more performant because of the Dart itself. So it's, it's, it's a bit safer to, to write a good code in Dart than in the JavaScript or TypeScript. <laughs> so yeah, that sometimes the, the loophole in the, in the React Native that it's, it might look slow, but mostly because of the React itself and how the code is written. Yeah. But of course, going back to the question, so. It depends on the, on the, on the product and what we need to achieve. Let's say, first of all, if we would look at the project broader. So if we need not only mobile, but also the web as a, as a, another platform. So then for example, we have to keep in mind about the server side rendering or what the React Native web would be better. And also in React Native and React Native web, you can use any web technology, what you want to. So it's definitely a bit easier to develop the web app using the React Native. On the other hand, in the, in the Flutter, you have the ready to use solution developed by the Google team. And also you can use the same thing to the, to the desktop app. What is not by default in the React Native as the separate libraries. When it comes to the Ionic, I think, you know, it is great if you already have the web app and you just need to deliver quickly some simple app to the mobile and you can just wrap it in the capacitor, adjust some UI and yeah, and that's it. And you have already the, some, at least prototype of the, of your mobile app. And then you can think if you need something more or change to the React Native or Flutter or anything. Also, what is great with, with Ionic at this moment, because it's just a capacitor, you can use any JavaScript framework at this moment. So, or just use Vanilla.js. And that's nice because it's give you more flexibility, especially if, for example, someone uh, already has some team in the web technology, and then you can just deliver it to the, to the mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. 
So what would you say are the most critical factors for developers to consider choosing cross-platform frameworks for their project? I, I think I, I just said a few things about that. So first of all, if we want to pick only the mobile or also other platforms like web or desktop. So for from my perspective, I would use probably the Flutter for the desktop app. And what I've seen, so Microsoft is really interested in both anyway, in the Flutter and React Native, but for, for the desktop apps, I think at this moment, Flutter looks really nice and because you can, you can use the, uh, the same code base with what is built in the library itself to, to develop the desktop app. What, what I already described about the, about the web support. So we have to consider what web features, let's say we would see half in the app, how the app will be you know, growing across the following months or years. So we have to consider in general how the big app will, will be. Uh, for example, if we are considering Ionic over Flutter or something, how much content we would have in the app, how long lists uh, we would render and things like that, because it's, it's also gave some like performance limitations in specific uh, solutions. For example, if we would develop app in Flutter, we have more control over the animations and things like that. So it's definitely nice to, 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 to use Flutter for setup. And yeah, I, I think in, in most cases, other than that, it's right, like really small things. And if we just from the developer perspective, choosing something, it's more about like how easily we can develop something and what is our preference because from from technical perspective at this moment i think you know the the both at least uh react native and flutter are really similar and uh, the flutter in the in the last two years have developed a lot a lot of packages on the path that you can find at, at this moment almost everything <laughs> what uh -huh. you would need and the same thing comes to the react native maybe with this one small thing that's React Native can use also all of the pure JavaScript world libraries. So yeah, sometimes it's easier to find some ready solution, but on the other hand, you have to be more careful about the quality of, of the libraries. So yeah, in short, this is my summary. Okay. So was the book then mostly about, about when to choose which technology or what was the, like the key findings in the book where you distinguish the free technologies? Was there some trends or what do you see in five years used more often from the free technologies? Well, I, I think at this moment in the book itself, we just describe all of the technologies you, you mentioned and I. I, I don't think we can easily say how to choose the specific one. Of course, we can in the in the in the book we described a bit which one would be better to pick. But in general, I'm always saying that every we can use almost everything to to, to every product. Uh, but yeah, in, in the book itself, we describe the every of these three solutions. We trying to the pros and cons in specific contexts and when to use the specific technology. And also how you can approach the challenges with, you know, with when you are seeing some limitation, for example, that you can connect the native part of the uh -huh. app with the, with the cross platform. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. And now let's head over to a little bit more flutter enthusiastic development interest. Martin, what features or advantages do you think make flutter stand out from other cross platform frameworks? Yeah. So that's a good question. As, as Hubert mentioned, there's not that much of a difference in, you know, when the app is, is built already and when you are using the application, there's not much you can do about, I mean, there's not much that one is in, in ways that one is better than another. I think the most thing that Flutter provides is that it is a proper framework. So it provides many tools, not only for building the application, but also for the code quality and the, you know, general project management stuff. And it's delivered to you with the SDK. So uh -huh. yeah, the testing framework is there even for the integration test, which is practically almost an end-to-end -end test. Uh -huh. And there are static code analysis tools. You are even started with some lint rules. Do that performance debugger is there. You don't have to pick one. It's already there. Package manager is also built in, but this is true for, for any other. 
but yeah, maybe the integration is a bit better because this is already delivered to you. There's no alternative, I would say. So it's very much intertwined. And even at, at, at last point, there are two UI libraries provided for you to use. So that's something that other platforms are not doing for you. You have to pick something. There are solutions, but you have to pick those. So the mix and match approach, which is also, I'm not saying that flutters is better. It's just different. The problem, there are many benefits to this mix and match. There are more competition, I would say. So that's what inspires developers to be better and better with their product, even at open source. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one downside is that it's very important to me, at least in different projects, even in, if you are using the same general technology, but if it doesn't follow the framework approach as Flutter does, those projects can look completely unfamiliar to the developer that is switching. So technically you have developer that is using React Native or Ionic, but it might be that they have used something very different than you do. And mm -hmm. this prolongs boarding, but also later, as I also stated before, uh, developers are really attached to, to solutions whenever they feel, they feel comfortable with them. And then very heated discussions are emerging around those. So sometimes there's a bit of discussion that might be not necessary would if one proper solution would be in place that you don't have to pick every core technology for your project each time you start a project on this mm -hmm. yeah i can imagine i think i have oh, so much discussions about the mui package and that we should use it material ui from mm -hmm. react native i think it is there were some very interesting discussions <laughs> yeah so what would you advise for beginners or intermediate developers looking to enhance their cross platform development skills and stay relevant in the industry yeah, so definitely for beginners, I, I know that this is, this is used a lot. The phrase, everything is a widget. This is not completely true. I mean, mostly yes, but don't feel bad to, to write something else than a widget in Flutter. It's okay to, to write non-widgets components in Flutter. I find this, I find this very, yeah, yeah. You can see that sometimes beginner developers are trying to develop something as a widget because of this, and it doesn't really work. There are many problems that you could just avoid creating a, you know, a component and I mean, a class that you are instantiating and not a widget because yeah, they are called so. And yeah, so another thing is that even if very mature at this point, cross-platform solutions often have to be enriched with native site, or at least you have to consider this native differences. Mm -hmm. Even if you have a packet for something that tries to bridge this gap, often there are so much, the, the discrepancies between the platforms are so big that it's very beneficial to have some native level of the platform you are developing for. So it's, it's very beneficial if, even if you are specializing cross platform to have, you know, iOS tutorial that you are building some application to see how the apps are built there and, and some general idea of how to use Xcode and Android Studio properly, because uh, sooner or later you will have to go there to do something there. Right, because uh, at, le uh, at last we are building a native application that is only packaging whatever cross platform solution you are picking. Very true. I think even the entitlements is now a big issue, right, in Android Studio and Xcode that you should at least know. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Can you recommend some resources, tools, or practices that you mm. helped you to improve in that cross platform field? Latin as this framework is, uh, and the um, the origin as, as Google, Google mm -hmm. is very big on documentation and the documentation of Flutter is also very descriptive. Everything is described and have links to other relevant sources. So even going through, you know, if, even a basic container, or at least you may think that this is a basic widget. If you go to the documentation, you will see how much functionality there is packed, uh, packed up mm -hmm. and how many solutions are there already written for you. So sometimes I see developers trying to figure this something specific out and it turns out that flutter already is providing this widget it's just problematic to you know know all of all of the functionalities that are there because so many are already packaged in there mm -hmm. so just going through the documentation starting this you know inspect or whatever you id you are using just go to the source code and try to figure out what the component what the specific widget from flutter is capable of and mm -hmm. also the documentation of Flutter is very big. So even the guides, if you are heading to flutter.dev and you go to the documentation, there are many guides that are, I think, maybe not as prominent in other frameworks. So they are guiding you through how you solve 
even more more specific problems like deep linking or put notifications. I think there's also a guide for that in the stock Flutter documentation. So going through all of those resources should be beneficial. Other stuff that is also built by Google and, and Flutter team is the YouTube channel. So it's yeah, plenty of content. There are a few years of, of content you have to catch up if you are not there. And even uh, this week, they started another series, which is very dug into the inner workings of Flutter. It's called, I think, Flutter Build Show or something similar. And uh, the topics there are meant to be very, let's say, it's for seniors, senior developers that are very much edge cases there. Not something that you would probably use in day-to-day -day work, but it's nice to see how to solve some problems that you are not able to, to solve now, or at least the problems that you might not be even aware at some point that will hit you. So they are already creating a very sophisticated process for you. So in short, you should just follow Flutter resources on YouTube and Medium. They are also active on Medium and you should be good with keeping up with whatever new is there. Yeah, that's true. I think the code labs are also pretty good to follow yeah. along. Cool. With the growing popularity of AI-powered tools like ChatGPT, Copilot X, and AutoGPT, how do you use or how do you see the impact on the cross-platform development workflows? Not too different, actually, from any other code development workflows. So I, I don't think that this is something special in, in cross-platform world. But yeah, it's just a welcome addition to, to every developer toolset. Uh, so yeah. Just one maybe advice, don't make your questions too specific. Don't expect a proper code out of there. Maybe use more general phrases, general issues to, to talk and maybe see whatever nomenclature you don't already know about specific problem because it might guide you to a, some documentation on the web that will be helpful for your specific problem. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's very, very useful. It's just we are trying to figure out the best way at this at this point, how to how to use it properly? Yeah, sure. Do you have already some experience at Monterail with these tools? I can share my experience a bit. I'm not using this day to day, but I tried using it as a rubber ducky, so mm -hmm. or pair, pair programmer because it responds back in contrary to rubber ducky. So you can explain the problem and maybe inspire yourself, or at least change your you know, mindset from the specifics, from being dug down into the specific problem and just trying to explain what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And as with Robert Duck, you are, you know, good to go at some point just by switching contexts to, to trying to describe the problem to someone. And the nice thing is that often this someone, this chatbot will guide you maybe through, through the thought process or at mm -hmm. least some resources that there might be something that we are not aware of in the technology that would be helpful for your case. As for Copilot, I don't have many experience with this. I don't find this useful. I, I always like to write my code on my own. So that's the problem with even the IntelliSense, basic ones. So just maybe my opinion, but yeah, Copilot, mm -hmm. I see it's useful for starter projects, like for example, data science project, when you are often doing the same commands just on different data, and then it can figure out automatically for you what you are trying to do by steps that you have already taken, because those mm -hmm. steps are very similar. Not sure what about the cross-platform, because those applications, if you, you, if you have a template that you are starting with, it might be that you are starting with a business problem, and then this wouldn't be much of use for you. But for, yeah, for starters, for starter projects, I think it might be useful just to speed up this a bit. Okay. Interesting. All right. So with that, I would say let's switch a little bit again to the industry insights because cross-platform has a very big industry in general. It's quite more and more getting more and more interesting for more and more companies. So what do you think are the most significant challenges if you face cross-platform development and how do you overcome them? Let's start with you. I think this is what, what we've mentioned. It's like two times already. <laughs> so... When we are going in the cross-platform development, I think almost every developer bump, bump into in some obstacles because we didn't know about some platform specific things or how the app behaves in the specific state. For example, whilst we, we were developing the voice calls at this point without the video, 
but we have some specific logic what uh, where, where the host can mute someone else or uh, some people can write the hand and then you you have the voice given and so on and yeah of course it works great when you are in the app and you are in the foreground so you have the access to the javascript thread but since you go back to the background still you can display the video or have access to the audio because it's based on the WebRTC protocol where you can process it, what you can process in the background. But uh -huh. now you, you, hand, you don't have the access to the JavaScript thread. So every WebSocket connection, what we have now is lost and we have to figure it out how to now manage the, mm -hmm. the feature in the, in the native code. So, and this is what many people are not thinking about when starting the development. And I think. In this context, we would have to know more the platform specific things, the, the native things in general, because the only when you know the, the platform itself really well, you can create your project and write the architecture to works really well in every scenario. Sounds nearly like the problem for all the software engineering, right? So even if backend or front end, if you have a good architecture in the front at the beginning, the rest should be solved already. So do you want to add something, Martin? Um, yeah, so I agree. It's always about the differences between the native platform capabilities. So it might be that, you know, that it, sometimes it's even as bad as one platform having some feature and the other didn't at all, doesn't at all. And that the most recent to have something specific, maybe not specifically through those changes, but also kind of too. Mm -hmm. I had problem with integration test framework with Flutter. The problem is that it works well, but it works only in Flutter itself. So whenever you have something that requires UI, a system UI to be interacted with or web view, it's just not capable of doing so because you only have access to, to widgets. And happily, I found Patrol. And this is a solution, a, a, also a framework, I would say, because this is a big project. And that adds the missing parts so you can interact with native system and it, it goes to the level up uh, than integration test submitted with Flutter. So yeah, I think that would be the one. So the interaction with, I mean, the proper end-to-end -end test so you can write and, and test your crucial tests in your application or the workflows in your application. Uh -huh. So yeah, whenever you have payment or you have to ask for location or for notification permissions, this is the only way, maybe not Patrol because there are other solutions to this problem too, but Patrol is the one that I, that I know developers of. So <laughs> that's why I think I, I have more trust in this one. Maybe I am biased a bit, but it's very nice to use. And this is the solution to my problem. Very good. Yeah. I heard also from some apps that they got really blocked out of testing because at the beginning there was this native allowance for some yeah entitlements and he could not s select yes on it and it was blocked out of the whole integration test part and yeah how do you do see the future of cross-platform development do you think it will be more or do you think it will go more and more to native back in my opinion if we look at every industry not only the you no know, it so we are going in a direction when we want to deliver things faster, produce things faster or more at the same time. And I think the same thing comes to the, the IT and to the development at the, any part. So I think the cross platform is one of the steps in that di direction. Of course, I don't think it would like completely replace the native development, but it could be the really, really big part of the app development in general. Also, I think at this moment when we have the phones really fast one and you can access to that, to the, a lot of memory, CPU and so on, I think the differences are still, are even smaller when it was like a few years ago. So definitely this is something what, what will grow and we can see that what's doing the other companies like Shopify, like Microsoft. Meta and Google and yeah, and ma many other companies and they invest their time and money in the cross platform. And of course, as we were talking about the AI recently, I've watched the podcast, watched, listened to the podcast with the, with the Bill Gates. And 
I think it's like, you no, know, the really nice thing when, when, when he experienced the whole path, because he started as one of the, of the things. So the, the PC, the own PC, what he predicted that we will have, everyone will have their own PC, what was almost impossible to imagine on these days. Then uh, there was the internet and now he pointed that the AI will be the, the next part of the great revolution. And definitely it will affect the white collar jobs in some way. So in general, in IT, it also would affect industry a lot. I don't know how it's hard to predict, of course, but definitely if we were talking, when we are ta were talking about the copilot, chat GPT, other tools, even today, I just know, let's say played with the chat GPT to generate some code, what I already was uh, writing. And it generates almost the similar codes what I would write on. <laughs> so in many, in many places, I think it would be the really nice boost or like Martin said, at least some Robert Black, what you can talk with and, and, and see what, what is the other solutions. So yeah, this is, this is, this is of course, just my opinion, but I think in, in general, the, the, the cross platform, it will be growing. And also the AI will, will, would affect some, some, somehow this, this path also. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with the AI part. So this is definitely changing. We already also using this a lot. So OCRs, voice recognition and, you know, object detection, this is four years already in the making. So AI, we are using very, very heavily already. It's just the way that we can interact with the AI changes and we have to figure this out, how to make this the best. I mean, uh, what to do to make the best out of this. And the, the, the trend that I see, it might be controversial, but I think we'll be getting back with the desktop apps or the rewrites of those, because at some point it was very, uh, very big movement was there with um, and backed, I mean, VA backed applications. So. I would like uh, or, or appreciate Slack being rewritten, for example, from Electron to, to Flutter or something lightweight, because I don't have this installed just because of how much resources it, it takes, even though it, it's only for, I mean, sometimes you can call with video and audio, but often, most often you're just exchanging text and this is too much, at least for, for my taste. And yeah, I think it's already happening or at least at some level. Because, for example, the Ubuntu installer is rewritten, the new one is rewritten with Flutter. So I think that it will follow maybe not the product facing, and then maybe we won't start with rewriting Slack or everything else that we are using, VS Code and stuff, but we will start seeing those Flutter-based or React Native-based cross-platform solutions on the desktop more. Because, it, yeah, it's just stable solution for now which wasn't a few years back that we could use something native to write the application for the desktop. It was just easier to use Electron. Yeah, makes sense. I think Electron is just a container for web applications, right? And it just runs yes. more or less on desktop. Exactly. It has Most... some extensions, but yeah. No. Yeah. That was always good. So in your opinion, how can developers and companies adapt to these ever-changing landscape for cross-platform development to ensure the project success? So first of all, we have to be up to date with the, at least one <laughs> cross-platform tech and try to, you know, see how it's changing because React Native, for example, since it was introduced, changed a lot and introduced a lot of things, what makes it faster from the, for example, the Hermes engine. Now the new architecture, what is not like in every app, but we can start using it. And also the same thing comes to the Flutter. So yeah, before there was a bit, definitely the, no, more limited. Um, and at this point, uh, as we explained at this, at this moment, we don't see any like really limitations different than from the native apps. So yeah, first of all, we have to follow what's going in the fra fra framework itself and what's, what the teams are developing currently. Mm -hmm. Also, it's good to see if there are any other new tools because there are still like, for example, the Kotlin cross-platform, cross or maybe there will be any other what would may change the market a bit. And also we have to keep, keep in mind that no, uh, it is possible to have different parts of the apps, like I said, in different technology even, so it is possible. And we, we can even, if we would really want to 
I'll combine the React Native with Flutter probably, and it would work. But yeah, so I think it's 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 mostly about following what is going on in the in the framework itself, trying to be up to date, read the the notes from the from the from the teams what they are working on and what is the future state of the of the framework. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I just maybe to add, I mean, focus on your features, of course. But don't rush to implement them as, as soon as possible. So sometimes those, even though stable and well tested in, in production, it might be that you have to adjust this. So let others do this testing for you. But also it's tempting in Flutter, especially because of how easy it is to create animations, implicit ones, for example, to add more and more of those. And I, I caught myself into this trap adding ev heroes everywhere or, you know, animating every change on the screen with something. And uh, yeah, it turns out that average user is annoyed by those animations. So just, yeah, don't overdo them. If you have very, you know, tech-like users, maybe this is the, the way. So you can mm -hmm. impress them with this, but average user, average product shouldn't have too much of those animations, you know, bells and, and whistles to not confuse the user, rather focus on having stable, stable workflows the application i think that is amazing end word don't overdo it with animation very good no thank you very much you two for that very interesting interview giving us a very good insight into the work that you two are doing every day and yeah thank you that you have been here and i wish you a wonderful day thank you thank you bye bye Right. What a fantastic and insightful conversation with Hubert and Martin. It's always great to hear from industry experts and learn from them more about the future of cross-platform mobile development. That's all for today's episode of Flutter Beyond. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to our postcard and our YouTube channel to stay up to date for the latest news, updates and interviews in the Flutter community. Until next time and happy coding.